Its Native American name means river. A reflection of native roots, the Hatchie flows strong and proud and free. As the longest free-flowing tributary of the Lower Mississippi River, the Hatchie is the lifeblood for nearly 300 species of fish, mussels, and birds. It's also home to the largest forested floodplain in Tennessee, wetlands that for years were often thought to be useless. Because if, if you can't grow a crop on it, or if you can't graze cattle on it, or raise livestock, then of what use is it? And especially in West Tennessee, and a lot of these uh, flat areas here in the West Tennessee area, they, they looked to any, any way they could to, to drain that property, to make it productive. In their eyes, they were doing a good thing. They were taking unproductive land and making it productive. Construction of levees and ditches turned many wetlands into farmlands, where crops like soybeans and cotton were grown in the fertile soils. But there was a never-ending battle to keep the water out and unforeseen consequences to the environment. Water pollution from sedimentation, increased flooding downstream, and a loss of habitat that drove away wildlife. And that's really one of the things that we were somewhat short-sighted in uh, in West Tennessee in our efforts to channelize our rivers and, and all of the levees that were built. We didn't recognize or understand the long-term impacts. Levee was probably six to six to eight feet high. It was taking all of that down. There's been a lot of dirt moved, about 40,000 cubic yards. Today, Joey Woodard and the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Foundation are trying to right the wrongs of the past by returning these 685 acres of farmland to the wetlands they once were. Um, the, the entire perimeter of the property has been levied. Uh, we're just up on the first terrace of the Hatchie. Uh, inside of those levees, there's probably four to almost five miles of internal ditches. Tearing down levees and filling in ditches restores the natural hydrology, allowing water to flow where it wants to. But water is only one part of what will make it a wetland once again. There are three components to a wetland. It's, it's, you've got to have certain types of soils, uh, you have to have water, and you have to have certain types of plants. One of those plants is a woody perennial called the tree. Believe it or not, this is a wetland forest. Hidden beneath all this sage and millet are over 240,000 seedlings planted last year. Trees that will play a critical role in maintaining this wetland ecosystem. We've got about 23 different species planted out here. We want a diversity of trees, primarily for wildlife habitat. Diversity that also accounts for the varying degrees of wetness found in a wetland. In the lowest elevations, we'd have things like bald cypress, water tupelo, below with button bush. And then as you step up to what we call the next zone, it would be things like nutall oak, overcup oak, water hickory. We would have American elm, things like river birch and ash that we passed here. They would be the next elevation and adapt to that different zone. And then as you climb up in height, you'd move up to things in the highest elevation, such as a cherry bark oak, which is a red oak, and a swamp chestnut oak, which is a white oak. Most of us think it's something that always has water on it. A wetland can actually be dry at different types of the year. Actually, it can be an area that, that is just saturated in the upper parts of the soil for a couple weeks during the growing season. Besides providing habitat for wildlife, the trees also help purify the water. The trees will actually filter some of the sediment loads. The water will come through the site and you've got the base of the trees and the root systems and these tree root systems take up a lot of the water, but also a lot of those sediment deposits will catch around the base of the trees. With the changes that have been made, this land is now a functioning wetland. It will take time to realize its full potential, but the positive impact on the environment and especially the wildlife can already be seen. Uh, the response from the wildlife was instant. We saw white-tailed deer come back to the site, turkeys. You can hear songbirds uh, all through here in the winter. A lot of ducks migrate through this area. when they, So wildlife came back immediately. Uh, and uh, as soon as the habitat was here, they, they came back to the site. Back to the land that was meant to be. With over 70% of what used to be Tennessee wetlands lost to channelization in agriculture, Reclaiming these 685 acres might not seem like much, but it is a step forward, a return to the past that will help shape a better future. Probably won't happen in my lifetime, but I, I bet in my children's lifetime, they'll have the opportunity to come out here and hunt on a piece of public property. 
Uh, it's, it's really, it's really a, a, a profound feeling to know that, that you get to be a part of something that's going to be bigger than yourself and last a lot longer than, than our short time here. I'm Ken Tucker on Tennessee's Wild Side.